Good morning, and at this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording started. Thank you. Start recording started. Thank you. Backup started. Thank you. And Sergeant Polite, if you'd be able to start with your opening statement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the remote hearing on privileges and elections. Will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. Chair, we are ready to begin. Okay, great. Good morning and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Committee on Rules, Privileges and Elections. My name is Karen Kostelowitz and I am the chair of this committee. Before we begin, I would like to introduce the members of the Rules Committee present. We have Minority Leader Stephen Matteo, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council Member Margaret Chin, Council Member Rory Lansman, and Council Member Mark Traeger. And we'll, we'll be having, the speaker will be joining us shortly. I would also like to acknowledge Rules Committee Council Lance Polivi and the staff members of the Council's Investigative Unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer, and Andre Johnson Brown, Alicia Vastel, and Ramses Booten, Booten Investigators. We will consider the nomination of Kenseth Armstead for appointment to the Art Commission for the painter slot and Deborah Martin, I have put on my glasses, for appointment to the Art Commission for one of the layperson's slots. Should Mr. Armstead receive the advice and consent of the council, he will be eligible to serve the remainder of a three-year term that expires on December 31st, 2020, and another three-year term that expires on December 31st, 2023. Should Ms. Martin receive the advice and consent of the council, she will be eligible to serve the remainder of a three-year term that expires on December 31st, 2021. Chuck Davis, our Chief Compliance Officer, has briefed all members of this committee regarding the contents of each candidate's background investigation. The New York City Art Commission, also known as the Public Design Commission, reviews permanent work of art, architecture, and landscape architecture proposed on or over city-owned property. Projects include construction, renovation, or restoration of buildings, such as museums and libraries, cre creation or rehabilitation of parks and playgrounds, installation of lighting and other streetscape elements, and design installation and con conservation of artwork. The commission is composed of the mayor or his representative, the president of the Met, the president of the New York Public Library, the president of the Brooklyn Museum. One painter, one sculptor, one architect, and one landscape architect. There are three other members who cannot be painters, sculptors, architects, landscape, landscape architects, or active members of any other profession in the fine arts. All members must be residents of New York City, the mayor and the museum and library presidents serve in an ex officio capacity. All members serve on the commission without compensation. Members serve for three year terms or until a successor has been appointed and qualified. I'd like to welcome Mr. Armstead and Ms. Martin. And would you please both raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I so swear. Mr. Swear. Armstead? I so swear. Thank you. 
Mr. Armstead, do you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, thank you, Speaker uh, Chair Kauslovitz. Uh, good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Kozlovitz, members of the Rules, Privileges, and Elections Committee of this New York City Council. It's an honor to appear before you today. Thank you for considering my nomination to be a member of the New York Public Design Commission. My name is Ken Seth Armstead. I was born in Kew Gardens, Queens, and reared in Washington, D.C. Yay, Kew Gardens. <laughs> I received a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Corcoran College of Art and Design. And in 1990, I returned to New York to attend the Whitney Museum of American Art Independent Study Program. I have now lived and created in Brooklyn for three decades. For 20 of these years, I've been a homeowner and a landlord, first in Fort Greene, then in Greenpoint, and now solely in Crown Heights. Also, in this time, I achieved a Master's of Science from NYU's Tandon School of Engineering. My artwork has been included in historic exhibitions at the Whitney Museum of American Art, MIT List Visual Arts Center, Studio Museum in Harlem, Brooklyn Museum, the Newark Museum of Art, and my artworks are also in the collections of the Studio Museum, the Center Pompidou, African American Museum in Dallas, Texas, Newark Museum of Art, and numerous other public and private collections. This semester, I received an appointment as a lecturer at Columbia University in the Graduate School of Architecture, Preservation, and Planning. This fall, I will be a guest lecturer at Oberlin, St. Francis College, the Goethe Institute, New York, and Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Over the last three years, I received, I served as a member of the New York State Council on the Arts Visual Arts Panel. The panel awards grants to support the visual arts statewide. The role encompasses reviewing the creative programming and fiscal stability of not-for-profits that explore and investigate the issues and impressions of our contemporary environment from real to virtual. This includes a variety of genres, sculpture, video, painting, drawing, printmaking, photography. Some, some of the institutions are sculpture parks where artists are in direct dialogue with nature and the public, like Socrates in Queens or the High Line in Manhattan. Many are experimental facilities where new work is researched and developed like Pioneer Works in Brooklyn or Makerspace on Staten Island. Others are traditional white cube exhibition galleries like MoMA or The Shed. The Visual Arts Panel supports creativity and imagination. This past year, we awarded 1.4 million in 72 grants to 68 organizations supporting a wide array of living artists today. Public service is an institution in my family. My father fought in World War II and Korea. My mother helped pilot the Women, Infants, and Children's Program in the 70s. My half-brothers fought in Vietnam, and my service follows the example of founding mother, Phyllis Wheatley. Wheatley, while enslaved, became the first published African-American poet. In 1775, she sent a poem titled, appropriately, to His Excellency George Washington, to the then commander of our Continental Army. In the midst of the Revolutionary War that he was not winning, Washington responded and invited her to visit. Washington, the slave-owning founding father, and Wheatley, the enslaved 20-year-old African poet founding mother, broke bread together in 1776. A miracle. My artwork seeks to poetically address history. I focus on existing sites and monuments and celebrate all of the diverse voices hidden in and around them. The approach presents art regeneration in public spaces, a new monumentality over the old, unearthing multiple layers of storytelling, not only honors the forgotten, but also serves as a guide for an integrated future. Art anticipates cultural change. 
art and culture show us possible futures in the present. In the 90s, I created multimedia art on the legacy of Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, normalizing the American Muslim experience before it was widely accepted. For a decade after that, I developed the spook project about James Armistead Lafayette, the enslaved African and double agent spy whose intelligence reports led to the end of the American Revolution in 1781. This work filled in gaps in our history about the role of Africans and the role Africans played in the American Revolution. Public art has been my focus for most of the last decade. These works require meticulous historical research, rigorous engineering standards, and the public and the project management skills of a general contractor and developer. My public art commissions will be featured in the forthcoming book, Teachable Monuments, published by Bloomsbury Academic. My latest work, Boulevard of African Monarchs, which is presented by the Marcus Garvey Park Alliance and the New York City Department of Transportation's art program, Community Commissions, is on view in Harlem at 116th Street and Adam Clayton Boulevard until 2022. My life's work is to explore difficult terrain with creativity, finding bold new approaches to the combination of history and space. Serving the people of New York as a member of the Public Design Commission will be a great opportunity to enhance these goals. I believe my experience makes me well suited to the task of balancing three elements. First, the selection of beautiful art and assessing the elegance and viability of concepts in public projects. Second, evaluating the efficiency and cost effectiveness of proposed projects. Third, and finally, ensuring that the needs of local communities that host any project implemented are met with flexible, tailored solutions, creative solutions. In conclusion, I want to serve on the Public Design Commission because I believe it's my civic duty to both care for as an artist and improve the public space that we engage, the city and its use. I wanna thank you again for your time and attention to my candidacy. Uh, and I would gladly answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Any, anybody have any questions? Okay, with that, Ms. Martin, you thank have you. an opening statement. I do indeed, thank you. And thank you for that, Ken Seth. I enjoyed your statement. Uh, good morning. I don't believe the speakers joined us yet, but good morning, Chair Koslowitz, members of the New York City Council's Committee on Rules and, and Privileges and Elections. I'm Deborah Martin, and I thank you for considering my nomination to the Public Design Commission. It's an honor to appear before you today and a pleasure. My New York story starts at Kings County Hospital in East Flatbush, where I was born. But the reason that I'm here today before appearing before this committee started in Budapest, Hungary in 1956. That year, Russian tanks rolled into Budapest and that triggered the Hungarian Re Revolution and my parents' flight to the US seeking a better life. They met here in New York City and they married and they moved to Canarsie where I lived till I was five. I grew up hearing stories around the dinner table about that flight from authoritarianism. Lots of stories every night <laughs> and earlier desperate efforts to stay alive as Jews who were hiding in Budapest during World War II. And then of course the hard work and the ingenuity it took to survive in America. And we did much more than survive. I'm the first person in my family to have attended college and then um, university for advanced degree. And my family, my siblings followed and we've enjoyed excellent educations and rich lives. I'm acutely aware of the specific privileges that are afforded to white Europeans who immigrated to the US when we did. And I understand that uh, opportunities available to us have often not extended to others. My family's experience taught me that individual success relies on a web of social and municipal factors that aren't equally available to everyone. My professional experience has taught me that as well. 
This understanding and a sense of empathy propelled me to seek work that supports others who struggle like my family did to build a better life. So my life's work has been focused on creating a city where every New Yorker, particularly those living in under-resourced communities, where every New Yorker benefits from architecture and public spaces that ennoble and dignify our everyday lives. From the high performance guidelines that I published as executive director at the Design Trust for Public Space, to the community driven garden renovations and, and constructions that I oversaw leading New York Restoration Project, to my current work at the Van Allen Institute on the neighborhood's now pandemic rapid response project. I've worked to listen with humility to my fellow New Yorkers and to bring my skills to bear on some of our city's most important challenges and opportunities. In cities like New York, green infrastructure, health, affordable housing, social services all overlap in the public realm. When they're well designed and integrated, these physical and systemic urban elements can amplify other efforts to increase public health, to reduce crime, to build social and environmental resilience. But when they're poorly executed um, in any of these areas, that can lead to generation spanning disadvantages and devastating consequences. And we've seen that in some of our communities during the pandemic. Systemic challenges call for a cross-disciplinary approach. For example, public health responses to diabetes and asthma are supported by opportunities to connect with neighbors, to get adequate exercise in open space and to connect to nature, clean air, and clean water. These municipal assets provide maximum benefit when they're considered comprehensively with other investments. So for example, when we consider the design of a tree pit, which is admittedly a small urban capital project, we should think of it in the context of its impact at scale impl implemented across the whole city. So will it capture stormwater, lessening the burden on our combined sewer system? Will it decrease the need for irrigation? Will it support understory plants so that pollinators can use it and then go pollinate uh, plants necessary to grow food in our community gardens? Will it be beautiful? This integration across scales, across impacts, across users, that's what designers do. And this interdisciplinary perspective is the extraordinary strength we all gain as a city because of the Public Design Commission. The diverse perspectives brought to bear on every project that come before PDC help our city communicate what we really care about to visitors and to more importantly, what we really care about to our fellow citizens. Our environment, the buildings, the parks, plazas, and streets where we New Yorkers share our lives is the place where important messages are shared between each individual and the larger community of which we're all part. One message is communal in that design in the public realm articulates a shared civic identity, but it also, also can contribute under the best of circumstances to civic unity. So Central Park, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Empire State Building, they serve specific purposes, but they're also global icons in New York City. The other message that is communicated in the public realm is personal. And it says to you, you are or you are not an important person and a valued member of the community. So well-designed buildings and public spaces communicate respect and help us feel supported as unique and precious human beings while at the same time underscoring our value as citizens, each of us embraced by the larger culture. So in conclusion, in this moment of terrible loss, I have been so proud of fellow New Yorkers who responded with compassion, with generosity, with courage. Um, and that goes for all of you here today. COVID-19 won't be the last challenge we face as a city or as human beings. And because we don't know the exact form the next challenge will take, we have to ensure that our public buildings and open spaces are adaptable for distancing, for gathering, for food distribution, for outdoor education, to provide shelter, to provide joy. In short, for whatever use we might need to put them to. We are, as a city and as a people, immensely resilient. Our, our city can be designed and constructed to be equally flexible and resilient. 
it would be a great honor to me to serve my fellow New Yorkers working with PDC. So I thank each of you for considering my nomination. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're gonna open up to questions, starting with uh, the speaker has not joined us yet. So I have two questions I'd like to ask. And after any of my colleagues have questions, please raise your hand. These questions are for both candidates. First, what new design considerations or other considerations should the PDC prioritize during its review of projects in light of COVID-19? Ms. Martin, you can answer first. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really important question. And I would say that the key design consideration isn't really a new one. It's about um, looking at projects through the lens of flexibility, of cost efficiency, and of enduring value. So I think um, our, uh, as I, I said in my opening statement, our public spaces, our public art, and our uh, public buildings, they, they need to be adaptable and flexible to times when we need to distance, to times when we need to gather. So I think um, it, when viewed through that lens, that, that can give uh, a kind of um, information about how to make decisions about projects and how to advise them to move forward. Okay, thank you, Ms. Darmstead. Ah, thank you. That's a great question, council member, chair. The, I would like to agree with Deborah first. Uh, and I also would like to add that um, being nimble is ex especially important at this time. Uh, we're seven months into a pandemic. We don't know when it will end. A lot of proposals will come to the fore and some of them will already meet CDC guidelines. Some of them will meet city guidelines and state guidelines. Uh, and we need to be able to expedite, as I know PDC is already working to work on projects that have already met those criteria. And then, of course, there are projects that may come to the table that don't uh, adhere. And we need to be able to nimbly decide which from which and to be able to effectively suggest or make comment on and make additions to projects so that they meet those safety guidelines and that is the most important thing as we have this pandemic and you know we're in the third wave while well, we're in the the third push of this first wave and uh we don't know when it'll end and there isn't any vaccine that may save us so we really need to be uh, precise in how it is that we manage process the process that are coming in and be efficient thank you You are muted, Chair Kosselitz. Trying to stop you hearing the banging. <laughs> Second, how do you think the PDC can highlight and address the inequalities in adequate public facilities through its day-to-day -day operations? And for this question, we will start with Mr. Armstead. Thank you, that's an amazing question, Chair Kozlovitz. I really believe that the role of the PDC is vital to maintaining democracy in our city. And in terms of equity, and as an artist, my experience over the most of the last decade is being out, having boots on the ground and talking to regular people in plain English about art and the space around them. And I believe that's a vital civic duty. Um, when we do this, we're allowing that a, we know more about the communities that we engage, and we're going to be able to be more receptive uh, as uh, the Public Design Commission will be more receptive to how it is that communities can accept art into their lives. And I believe that that is a key role. It's, it's one of the things that I do. I have work up right now in Harlem. I'm in Harlem and uh, every other week to one week just to talk to people about the work. I was there six months before the work in was, was put in every other week. And I believe that as the Public Design Commission, as part of the mission, to be able to be boots on the ground and have that direct communication with people about how the public space, uh, especially in a pandemic right now, we have both a health 
crisis and a, and a mental health crisis. And people are out using these spaces and we need to be able to make sure that they respond appropriately and that you know this open space, which creates so much joy in people's lives can be made even more applicable to what it is that they are going through. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Martin. Um, I think PDC can highlight inequality in two ways. One is by making sure that it looks at projects through a very broad lens and situates particular projects in broader um, social and economic contexts um, and understand what, that we understand and we make sure that we communicate the connection between those things. And I'll, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Every year, the department, New York City's Department of Health puts out community um, annual community health profiles. And if you open up one of those annual community health pro profiles, you'll find language in there in every single one that talks about how the, and, and I'm gonna quote it here, the ability to live a long and healthy life is not equally available to all New Yorkers. And then it goes on to say that a baby born to a family that lives in the Upper East Side will live 11 years longer than a baby born to a family in Brownsville. This inequity is unacceptable. And it goes on to say that resources and opportunities are at the root of good health, including secure jobs, well-maintained and affordable housing, et cetera. So we understand that Department of Health isn't in control of all of those things, but it's contributing to our collective understanding as a city that your health as an individual is connected to these, these other factors. And that um, I think by, by highlighting inequalities across communities, as opposed to critiquing particular projects or agencies, PDC can highlight how we need to address these in inequities effectively citywide. Thank you. You're finished? I am indeed. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I now want to turn to my colleagues. If they have any questions, please raise your hand. Councilmember Chin and Councilmember Adams both have questions. Okay. Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Chair. And good morning. Um, it's really wonderful uh, to hear uh, the opening statement from two highly qualified candidate. <laughs> I'm really impressed with the mayor's nomination. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's very so, kind of you. Thank you. We don't get that too often. Um, my question is that, you know, the public design commission doesn't really have a good reputation um, with us. Because a lot of times, you know, projects takes forever. And that's what one of my questions following up with when we talk about, you know, how do we bring more equity throughout the city and really have, you know, creative uh, space in poorer communities. And oftentimes some of these projects that we support with council funding takes forever. Uh, so I think looking ahead, uh, being on the Public Design Commission, how can both of you make sure that communities are not left out, that, you know, that they are uh, included um, in the discussion, but at the same time that the project get expedited and not really, you know, that, that we could see it quickly uh, and be able to benefit uh, from it quickly. And, and that's something that I think is really important uh, for a lot of the community that you talked about that really need uh, to be taken care of. Thank you. Ken, Seth, do you mind if I, or, or do you want to go first? Okay. Um, thank you for that question, Council Member Chin. And I think um, I'm gonna start by saying that trust and speed is, are, the, are connected. And if things take too long, people start, and I have seen this in my own work, particularly in community gardens and under-resourced communities at New York Restoration Project. If things take too long, people become weary and they start to lose trust in their government. So um, 
I think to address the question that you raise of why I think that how, how can PDC help things to move in a way that earns trust. Um, my experience ranges from, I started my career as an attorney. I did corporate litigation and then I trained as a landscape architect. And my first work after that training was with the Department of Parks and Recreation. I went on from there to work as a landscape architect for James Corner Field Operations and then have led three nonprofits all focused on uh, the public realm and in particular New York Restoration Project, which is actually a land owner and manager. So from that, I, I think it has to be acknowledged that no bureaucratic agency is perfect, but that PDC by, by integrating the many complex factors that come into making sure that our public realm is equitable, it serves an important purpose. And what I'm hoping to do is bring um, that perspective that I have from being on pretty much every side of the equation of, of sort of frustration that you're addressing to help make sure that, um, that the value of PDC's input is, is one that helps to move things and to gain trust from citizens and, and not the opposite. Ms. Darmstead, you wanna? You have to unmute, Kinsa. You're, you're muted. Ah, just wanted to say that's an amazing answer, Deborah. And uh, I wanted to uh, follow on that, that my experience as an artist is that I'm in the communities that we're serving. My personal presence is in those communities. And um, I believe that my experience, I have made works at Socrates Sculpture Park in Astoria, Queens. I have made works in Central Park. I have made works in Union Square. And in all of those cases, at least six months before, I'm in those spaces and I'm talking to people. And I'm not talking to them about art theory. I'm talking to them about how they use the space and what do they expect? You know, there's an artwork that's coming and uh, I'm drawing and they're like, why are you drawing? I'm like, oh, it, uh, by the way, I'm making the artwork. And I'm talking to people all the time because what I'm doing is I'm taking a, a temperature of the room and I'm learning about that community and I'm becoming a part of that community. And I believe that my projects may start on a date, like the piece that, in, that ended up launching this year uh, I was delayed by COVID, but it ended up launching in the midst of a pandemic in June. Uh, uh, it, it began six months earlier when I was on that corner with my sketch pad talking to people. And they say, why are you drawing? And I'm like, why, you know, why wouldn't I draw here? And they're like, you know, I'm an artist too. And I'm like, you are? And so in some ways, whether or not a project is delivered by being communicative, you can start to deliver a project. Before my pieces ever go in, people are imagining what art on a street corner that's never had art before might be. Beyond that, I think as part of my role as an artist that I'm talking to thousands of people about art and plain English all the time. And also in every one of my cases, I have a community partner. So I've got the Marcus Garvey Park Alliance, the A. Philip Randolph uh, Community Board uh, 10 and 11 in Harlem. And they're my partners. So even before I'm out there on the streets, I know I have people who have been in that community for a long time. And that does build trust. And that builds this sense that there's certain things that can't be avoided. And I, don't, I can't say case by case what happened in the past. But I can say as an artist, you always have to make more from almost nothing. And you have to do it as quickly as possible because resources are not something that you're overly burdened with. So I'm all about being nimble and doing things as efficiently as possible. But even that said, even before a project goes in, I believe very much that my, my role, if I'm made a member of the PDC, is to bring a connection directly to those communities via conversation. So that even before they get anything, they know that they're starting to receive a service, which is creativity and a hopeful outlook about what it is that they're going to receive. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Chair Koslowitz. And thank you both uh, for being here today. Um, thank you for your testimony. And I, I did have a question, but alas, um, as very often what happens is that Councilmember Chin and I share the same brain. Um, and she so eloquently 
once again express pretty much what my question was. I wrote it down and it, my question is, um, how will you independently bring your broad perspectives to the PDC? Which is pretty much what you just answered um, independently. So I'll just make a short comment. Thank you so much, Council Member Chin, for always being the sister in my head, um, number one. And for the two of, of you, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with my colleague. The mayor has made such a wise uh, choice uh, in selecting the both of you uh, we have a historian who is also an artist, and we have uh, uh, Ms. Martin who is passionate and, and has so much compassion uh, for the people and the work that she does. So the both of you bring a tremendously broad perspective of life, of public service, and the uh, good and welfare of New York and all New Yorkers. And I have uh, the utmost faith in the both of you after hearing your testimony today. So thank you, and I wish you well. Thank you, so much. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Adams. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, the Rules Committee um, will now uh, take a vote on the two candidates. William Martin, Committee Clerk, roll call vote committee on rules, privileges, and elections on M253 and 254. The items are coupled. Chair Kozlowitz. I vote aye, and congratulations to both. Chin. I vote aye, congratulations, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Lanceman. Council member Lanceman. Okay, we'll come back. Council member Traeger. Council member Adams. Uh, once again, I look forward to the full body vote this afternoon. Congratulations to the both of you. I enthusiastically vote aye. Matteo? Yes. Speaker Johnson? I vote aye. Thank you, Chair Koslowitz, and congratulations uh, to our uh, nominees today. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Council Member Lanceman. Mr. Clerk, who are we missing? Uh, Council Member Lanceman is signed on. Uh, Traeger was on. I don't see him now. And then there's Council Member Rose and Torres are not on at the moment. Yeah, Council Member Rose uh, is to be excused. She has a family emergency. Mm. And uh, let's check on Council Members uh, Traeger, Lanceman, and Torres. If you could just hold the vote. Sure. I'll announce the vote and we'll, we'll leave it open. Sure. Okay. So uh, by a vote okay. of five in the Affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Both items have been adopted by the committee, and the vote will be Thank held you. open. Councilmember Lanceman is about to come on. Okay. Uh, someone needs to resend the link to Councilmember Traeger. His link isn't working. 
I'm resending it now. Hi, it's Councilman Lanceman. I'm sorry, I, I got uh, disconnected, shall we say. No problem. Councilman Lanceman on M253, M254. Roll call vote. I vote aye. Thank you, sir. Vote is now at six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Vote is still open. Okay, folks, I think I'm back. Okay. And I vote 53 and 254, Council Member Traeger. I vote aye. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. Vote is now at seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstention. Okay. We can close the meeting now. Hold on one moment, Chair Kozlowitz. Council Member Torres has indicated that he is about to sign on. Okay. Here he is. I'm here. I'm here. Billy, can you call um, Councilmember Torres's name? My apologies, I was on mute. 
Roll call committee on rules 253 and 254, Council Member Torres. I vote aye. Thank you. Okay. Final vote Thank now you. on these two items will be eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Thank you. Okay, now we can close, right? Yes, you just have okay. to adjourn the meeting. Okay, this meeting is now adjourned.